Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming out here today. So um, I'm going to talk about Polkadot in the context of interoperability of blockchains. And um, let's, uh, let's basically just right, jump right into it. So brief about me. Uh, I'm Gautam Dhameja. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with Parity Technologies. Uh, most of the time, I'm helping our uh, potential customers, uh, enterprises, blockchain, uh, or governments, or startups to help build on uh, the parity stack, uh, mostly on, on the building app-based blockchains and how to connect them with Polkadot and so on. So that's me. And um, let's, let's um, go into the Polkadot uh, side of things, how uh, we look at interoperability and how we actually realize that we want something like this. So um, <clears throat> it's going to be something in continuation uh, to what Billy just mentioned, like why we need interoperability and um, base, uh, what, what has brought uh, us to this point. So let's, let's look at what's the status quo at the, at the moment. Um, first of all, the whole um, uh, categorization and uh, building of these app-based blockchain um, started when we realized that uh, one framework, one um, platform, or one network will not be able to provide all the uh, fundamental characteristics needed for all kinds of blockchains. Uh, we are every day we are looking at these different blockchains popping up uh, around the ecosystem. Some some of them are providing identity, some of them are providing payments, some of them are providing uh, a, a few other characteristics, but. Uh, the focus has now been uh, moving more and more towards one single use case, do it and do it uh, better and do it best, basically. And it's not uh, about um, like doing everything um, anymore. So that's one of the patterns that we have been seeing coming up uh, a lot in the recent uh, developments in our blockchain ecosystem. And that's uh, one part of it, basically. The second uh, most important part is uh, the mass adoption. Um, what I personally also believe is that until uh, the larger enterprises and the governments don't start using our um, ecosystem, our technologies, they will not be gaining mass adoption in the near future. So it is important to help them also build the solutions that they want to build for the decentralized space. And most of the time, their requirements are very different from what uh, conventional blockchains will, will uh, look like. So a lot of times they need um, some level of permissionings. A lot of times they need some privacy of state, uh, arbitrary message passing, and so on. So those are some of the uh, characteristics which are specifically needed for some of the use cases. And um, not the current uh, frameworks or platforms of today, not all of them provide this in a, more, uh, in a fully decentralized or permissionless way. And uh, finally, uh, when we uh, combine the last two arguments that I just presented, that uh, there are several chains popping up every day, and then there are different requirements from the enterprise side and the government side of things, we are looking at all these fragments being created in, in different corners of the world. Like today, again, there was this uh, announcement of the uh, Facebook coin chain. And then uh, a few weeks ago, there was an identity chain being built by Microsoft and uh, so on. So we are, again, looking at those fragments, which uh, we actually wanted to not have when we were starting with the whole blockchain ecosystem. We wanted a connected world. We wanted a more uh, decentralized and transparent world. And now, again, we are looking at these fragments. So how do we uh, basically make sure that we are bringing these things together, we are bringing these ecosystems together? So that's where the whole um, need for interoperability is, is uh, realized. And uh, before, before we go into how we solve that problem with Polkadot, let's also look at uh, what exactly is needed to solve uh, the problem of interoperability. So the first thing is um, a common platform. Uh, until uh, chains or networks or systems are not able to talk to each other in a standardized way, they will not talk to each other, basically. So it's as simple as that. If I'm able to communicate things to you today in English, you are listening to me. If I was speaking Hindi back from India, you will not be listening to me, most of you. So we need a common platform to talk to each other, uh, or the systems need a common platform to talk to each other, first of all. Uh, and hence, we are looking at something like an infrastructure for the infrastructure. So if, if um, the new teams, which are coming up with their own app-based blockchains, they are uh, creating infrastructure for solving a use case, we need infrastructure to actually enable their infrastructure itself. So that's the first need where we are looking at uh, when we want to solve the problem of interoperability. 
The second and the most important thing is trust, of course. Um, while we are looking at a lot of trustless systems, we talk about um, uh, environments where we uh, want to give up with trust and look at in, uh, immutability and decentralization. We are also like uh, kind of this is something uh, more um, a behavioral kind of thing that if I am able to communicate with you and if I am able to trust you, then I will be able to deal with you. And sim the exact same thing um, applies for systems as well. If they are able to talk to each other, which was my previous slide, and if they are able to trust each other in some way or the other, they will be able to communi uh, communicate and interoperate with each other. And that's the most important second part. Is And when it comes to blockchains and, and the uh, context of uh, decentralized systems, uh, trust is more about finality. Uh, if one chain has... Um, a state that can be reverted or there are Byzantine actors which are working towards making this chain unstable, then the other chain should not be impacted by that. Secondly, the most important point is the security. Uh, if a chain is feeling um, basically secure with, with, by connecting to a network, by exchanging information over that particular infrastructure, then it will be very, very helpful for uh, these chains to interoperate with each other. So those are the uh, primary uh, two needs when we are trying to solve the problem uh, of interoperability. We need a common platform. We need chains to be able to uh, talk to each other in a standardized way. And secondly, and most importantly, they should be able to trust this platform which uh, they are using to talk to each other. So that's where I want to um, jump now into the Polkadot uh, side of things, how we are solving these two problems, how we are bringing uh, a common framework, a common platform into the ecosystem, and how um, chains are allowed or enabled to trust this common infrastructure. So let's uh, look at how we are looking at uh, the interoper interoperability side with uh, uh, Polkadot. So when it comes to blockchains, there are two basic things that we are looking at most of the times. It's one is the state transition, that there, there are these transactions coming in into the chain and they are taking uh, the chain from one state to the next state. And that's basically uh, depending upon use case to use case that differs a lot uh, among chains uh, for an identity related chain. This could be a creation of a new identity or an update of a new identity for a financial uh, settlements chain. It's just uh, subtraction and addition of balances. So that's uh, very different from chain to chain. And then the second part is consensus on how you basically agree that a state has really changed or not. So what we are doing with Polkadot is uh, allowing both of these side of uh, blockchains, the state uh, transition and the consensus to be uh, basically connected together. Uh, even if the chains are doing different kind of state transitions for their different use cases, underlying uh, infrastructure allows them to still interoperate with each other. Secondly, the uh, problem about finality and uh, what's going to be, what, what was the state previously, what was the state next, and with, will, whether it will be reverted back or not. That's the past, present, and the future of the blockchain that also uh, connected. And I'll jump right into it in, in a couple of slides uh, after this. And finally, um, the third part is about uh, connecting public and private networks. Uh, like I mentioned previously, uh, when we were looking at uh, cre uh, how the silos are being created, the one thing which was coming up was uh, cre creation of these private chains, enterprise chains, which were basically being uh, just uh, coming up as fragments because they, their needs are very different. They are, they are required to do a lot of other things uh, apart from uh, just decentralization and keeping the state immutable. So how do we make sure that we connect both private chains and public chains is also a most uh, thing that uh, Polkadot helps us solve. So a uh, high level and uh, uh, 10,000 feet level uh, view of uh, Polkadot is basically we have three major components in the system. The relay chain, which is basically the, uh, the central infrastructure of uh, Polkadot, which allows other chains to connect and talk to each other. Then we have the parachains, and these are the application-specific chains, which are uh, kind of being built using the same uh, framework and the platform so that they can communicate with each other. If they are not uh, following the same uh, practices, if they are not following the same standard uh, standards, then again, there is a problem of fragmentation. So this is how we are uh, basically coming up with this whole framework for building parachains so that they can connect to uh, the Polkadot relay chain and talk to each other. And finally, bridges. So bridges are uh, basically allowing existing chains which are not built using the parachain framework which is substrate if you've heard about it 
So if if your chain is not following the exact uh, the the consensus and the uh, and is not connected directly to the Polkadot network using a slot, then they can still be connected to the network using bridges. So for example, chains like Ethereum, uh, Zcash, Bitcoin, they can be connected to the Polkadot uh, network using Ethereum and uh, oh sorry uh, bridges, and uh, they can still interoperate with the other para chains and these other existing chains in themselves. How this looks like is basically um, something like this, which I will explain in detail. Um, so the core middle part, which you see as a uh, dark black uh, outline in the middle, that's the relay chain. And those white uh, things inside that is, are the blocks for the relay chain. Uh, the lines that you see in between, which are basically like uh, kind of creating the web, are inter-chain uh, message passing. So that's how the relay chain is helping pass all these messages from one chain to other. The next layer basically are the validators for the relay chain. So they are um, making sure that the blocks are being added to the chains one after the other. And uh, they are uh, taking care of the security and the recentralization of the relay chain itself. And the third layer are the parachains themselves. They are directly connected to the relay chain and uh, submitting their blocks to the validators of the relay chain. And finally, if you uh, look at the next level, those are the second level relay chains and the bridge chains which are connecting to the relay chain using bridges or second level or the first level relay chain itself. So this is how uh, basically a whole ecosystem uh, based on Polkadot looks like, that everything is fully decentralized, fully permissionless, but is still uh, able to interact and interoperate with each other uh, in, in a very, very standardized way. So <clears throat> what we are uh, using and how we are building this ecosystem, uh, we are Again, using Rust programming language to build the framework for building parachains. And the Polkadot relay chain is also being built using the same framework called Substrate, and which is based on Rust. Then uh, WebAssembly, uh, the most important and crucial part of uh, frame, uh, our framework components is because uh, if you are already aware of, then let me uh, not aware, then let me tell you about it that Polkadot is um, inherently upgradable. So it has on-chain governance, and you can actually upgrade the runtime of the chain uh, at any point in time after getting through consensus. And um, the most crucial aspect over there is WebAssembly. So Ves um, Wasm allows us to do that without any problem, because you can simply upgrade the environment on Wasm, and still the native environment is uh, fully functional at that point in time. So that's, uh, that's uh, the second most important aspect. And then the third, finally, aspect is about the lib P2P, the flexible uh, P2P protocol, which is like uh, designed by the protocol labs team. And then we have implemented that in Rust. And we are using that for uh, Polkadot and for substrate-based chains as well. So uh, going back to the initial uh, uh, set of problems that we, are, um, we were looking at when we were trying to solve uh, the interoperability issues. And the first thing that we uh, looked at was a common platform is needed, which, which can allow these apps to actually interact with each other in a uh, standardized way. And that's why we want to make sure that all the apps that are inter uh, app chains or para chains that are interacting with the uh, Bolgadot ecosystem are, uh, can be as heterogeneous as they can be. They can have their state transition function as, um, as they want. There should be scalability. Um, uh, the, the whole problem of um, the major, major problem at, in our space right now is scalability. And that's, again, how we solve it is by pooling these uh, chains together. So if there is an identity chain, and if there is a uh, payment settlement chain, and if there is, uh, let's say, a supply chain uh, blockchain, then they are actually now, uh, and they are all connected to, let's say, the Polkadot relay chain, they are actually uh, not doing all of the same thing uh, together in one chain, but they are uh, you know, dividing these users. If somebody needs to just transfer Bitcoin, they don't have to really do, uh, or bit, not Bitcoin or some uh, financial coin, they don't have to really go through a chain which is doing everything, which is also having transactions of supply chain or uh, having transactions of identity. They are just uh, interested in basically getting uh, transferring some uh, financial value. Similarly, if somebody wants to authenticate using their identity system or if they want to create an identity self-sovereign on the blockchain, then they don't have to worry about other transactions that are uh, coming from the uh, financial chain. So this is how we are uh, approaching the problem of scalability is uh, like the chains will have their own use cases, and they will do uh, that in a more efficient way, and they don't have to worry about other things uh, which generally are um, being, uh, being uh, done in most of the current frameworks. 
so to say. And finally, this uh, security model, um, like we said, uh, the other uh, major uh, thing to solve for interoperability was uh, security. So Polkadot uses this pooled uh, or shared security model where the validators of the parachain are basically uh, allowing, oh, sorry, the validators of the relay chain are uh, s swapped and they allow, and they basically allow the parachains to add blocks to the relay chain. And they are, uh, allowing all these uh, parachains which are connected to the Polkadot ecosystem to uh, basically be secure in a more comprehensive way by basically interacting with each other. So that's how the pooled security works. And let's uh, look into where we are currently with the Polkadot um, um, build, uh, development. So it's, it's being approached in a very similar way how uh, Ethereum was uh, being built in the initial stages. Um, and, our founder Gavin Wood is is also he was also the first co uh, CTO of Ethereum and, uh, and so we are following the exact same approach. We are doing a bunch of POCs, uh, tackling one problem at a time. So we have uh, we have recently done the um, these some of these POCs and uh, the next ones are uh, basically coming up where we are looking at uh, migration of a uh, substrate build chain uh, to be working as a parachain and then we will be uh, hopefully by the end of this year or. Uh, beginning of next year, we'll be uh, looking at a mainnet launch. Well, uh, thank you for listening to the story, and um, questions uh, are most welcome. Uh, you had mentioned that Polkadot supports blockchains with, with a private state. How does that work with fishermen? Because like, how do they uh, I guess, do fraud proofs on the private state? Um, so. The way it, it uh, works is basically that there will be uh, not all the state is private state. It's basically a subset of the state which needs to be there on the uh, needs to be looked by the parties which are interested in looking in, into that and which are authorized to look into that are to be uh, done with that. And there is always a verification that there is a state change has happened. For example, zero knowledge proof or something like that. So that's for the fishermen to basically still make sure that the information is coming out correctly and the state changes are happening um, as they should be happening while the actual state is visible only to the people who are authorized to see that. Let's see, assume that there is already a snark that's like valid and state change. We, uh, th there are teams working on that side of things basically. So there is a uh, um, parachain uh, being built called Zero Chain which is basically doing zero knowledge proofs on substrate and which will uh, look something similar to this what, what we just discussed. Yeah. Um, what makes you sure that the end game is um, many different blockchains, each focusing on their own specialized single use case, and then there will be a need for something in the middle to connect them all? So, um, actually, nothing makes me sure, uh, but um, it's, it's more like the patterns that we have seen in the past, how we started with, uh, so it's, it goes back to like how the computing has in, evolved in the last few decades. It's always the same thing that we start with one system doing everything, trying to do uh, all of the things at the same time. And then we realize there are limitations to use that framework or platform. And then we try to, uh, you know, uh, fork out of that system and try, like, just like Billy explained that in the beginning there were so many forks of Bitcoin because uh, we wanted to scale, we wanted to do something different. So, Fragmentation always happens when there are limitations with one thing and people want to innovate. So there is always uh, one thing that is I'm very sure of is innovation, that people will keep on doing that, we'll, they will keep on breaking the boundaries. And to do that, you need an uh, extensible framework. You need something which can allow for doing that, otherwise you will be building something on your own. And if you are going to build something on your own separately, then you are creating fragments in the ecosystem and how do you connect these fragments together? Uh, do I answer your question? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much again.